Hi. So um, uh, my name is Samit Videra. I do uh, epilepsy surgery at uh, University of California in Irvine. I'm the director of epilepsy surgery. And uh, my talk is on who is a candidate for epilepsy surgery. Um, I did try and take out as much of the surgical slides, intraoperative slides, but uh, there may be one or two in there, but uh, just so you know. Um, so just to go over the outline a little bit, I'm going to start by talking about the history of epilepsy surgery. And I think it's important to know a little bit about the history to really understand what we're doing uh, in terms of, of our, uh, you know, how we plan on, look at patients, how we treat patients in, with epilepsy. I'm going to talk about some of our decision-making skills, our, our, you know, our processes, so how we decide what patients are surgical, um, what type of surgeries we offer, and then also a little bit about how, how safe and effective these surgeries are. And then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about certain cases that we've done that I think really highlight some of the, the things that we do in epilepsy surgery. So I'll start by showing this. This was the old thinking. So about 70, 80 years ago, there was a problem in, in uh, neurosurgery and epilepsy surgery in that people would come in with lesions. So a lesion could be a tumor, it could be um, a stroke, it could be a trauma. And you know, they would have surgery to have that lesion removed. And interestingly, after the surgery, they would still have these seizures. They'd had seizures before surgery, and then they continued to have seizures afterwards. And people used to think that, you know, the, the area where the seizures were coming from was somewhere within the, that lesion. And so when they would take out the tumor, they expected the patients to be seizure-free, but it turned out that they weren't. That really went on until about 70 years ago when this gentleman here, Dr. Penfield, um, started to do uh, surgery in Montreal. And so uh, Dr. Penfield, along with Dr. Jasper, who was his uh, epileptology colleague, um, they did some very interesting experiments. So what they did was they would take patients who had seizures and they had a lesion, say they had a tumor, and they would do a, a surgery, they would, the patient would be awake, and they would expose that tumor, and they would take a, a, a very low electrical stimulation and they would stimulate right on top of that tumor. And what they found was that the patient's were just like they normally were. They didn't have you know, a seizure intraoperatively. Then what they started doing was stimulating around that area, and what they were, would find is that oftentimes they could stimulate an area in the brain surrounding the, the, the tumor, and uh, they could cause the patient to have a seizure. Even more interesting than that is that if you just took out the tumor, they would not be seizure-free, but if you took out both the tumor and the area where the seizures came from, the patients often would become seizure-free. And so that's really kind of the basis for what we do here. A lot of what we do in epilepsy surgery is looking for uh, when patients who have a lesion, not only treating the lesion, but treating the, the part where the seizures are coming from. Now, back then, they didn't have much, you know, like I said, they would do an open surgery and they would stimulate parts of the brain and that's how they figured it out. Nowadays, we have, much, we have very high-tech things, so we have very high-resolution MRIs, we have PET studies, we have MEG, we have SPECT. All these tests are non-invasive ways to give us an idea of where the seizures are coming from. Now, um, uh, when I say us, like who's involved in that decision? So epilepsy, uh, people who undergo epilepsy surgery, they really are treated by a team. And I like to think of epilepsy surgery as a team, uh, you know, really the patients are best treated when there's a team approach. So in that team, we have neurosurgeons, we have neurologists, we have radiologists, neuropsych. Really, it's a, it's a um, very big team of people that look at every patient, and we tailor our surgery to each patient. Uh, that's one of the things that I think separates epilepsy surgery from some of the other surgeries that we do in, in uh, neurosurgery. So this is kind of the algorithm. This is what patients go through usually when they, when they um, are seen. So first, they go to our epileptologist. They get a history, an examination. Sometimes they're seen by neuropsych. Uh, often they'll get a high-resolution MRI, and then they'll ha have an uh, inpatient EEG monitoring. Once that's done, if the patient's considered an epilepsy surgery candidate, they're brought up to our epilepsy conference, and we discuss the patient there, and we talk about what other studies we could potentially use. Those are those non-invasive tests we talked about, so PET, fMRI, WADA, MEG, various tests that give us an idea of where the seizures may potentially be coming from. Then, depending on what we find with those tests, then the patient may go on to have some sort of invasive study, so subdural grid, SEEG, and then based upon that invasive study, uh, they may go on to have a resection. And I'm going to talk about all about this in a little bit, but just as just kind of give an idea. Now, of course, not every patient has to have these invasive studies done. So there are patients who have uh, all this workup and everything kind of points to one area, and those patients can go directly to a resection. 
the way I like to think of epilepsy surgery, this is how I you know, discuss it with patients, is that it's really two types of surgery, broad categories of surgery. And there's a diagnostic procedure, there's a diagnostic part, and there's a therapeutic surgery. And that's what we're going to get to right about now. So if you imagine, um, say you have all these tests done, and each test show, you know, points to a different part of the brain. So maybe the MEG says that there's potentially some seizure onset zone at one part of the brain, but the MRI shows something completely different. In those patients, what we tend to do then is we go on to some sort of an invasive diagnostic test. And these are the two major tests that, uh, surgeries that we do. One is a uh, subdural grid, and this, it, this you know, um, is actually a, a silastic uh, uh, grid with platinum electrodes in it. And what we do is we actually implant these electrodes right on top of the brain. Uh, then we wake up the patient, we put them in our epilepsy monitoring unit, and then we monitor for seizures. And then when we capture seizures, we know where the seizures are coming from, we go back and, and do the therapeutic surgery to treat those. Uh, similarly, we have SEEG over here, and this is uh, depth electrodes um, that we implant through percutaneous openings in the skin. And uh, then once we have information as to where the seizures are coming from, then those patients go on to have some sort of a therapeutic surgery. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about subdural grids and SEEG. In general, what we've been doing at uh, UCI is that the subdural grid patients, oftentimes those patients have seizures coming from an area in the brain close to a very uh, functional area. So that could be language or motor. Those are the mo two most common things. If we, if we think that our, our, if our hypothesis is that the seizures are coming from one of those areas, most likely the patients will have some sort of a subdural grid implantation. And as part of that, we map those areas. So we will actually, once the grid is in, we'll give a small electrical stimulation and actually localize where the language is, where the motor is, and then we can find where the seizures are in relation to that, and then we treat those. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we do that in a little bit. Uh, as you can imagine, one of the, the uh, things about this subdural grid is that it does involve a big incision. We make a big window in the bone. We have to open the covering of the brain, implant the electrodes. And so, of course, there's, you know, that's a, it's a big surgery. One of the benefits of SEEG, which is another surgery that we do, is that it's less invasive. We actually implant electrodes through very small pinhole openings in the skin and then implant those electrodes all the way down to the deeper parts of the brain. So it's a much less invasive test. People wake up and they look and feel like they really didn't have surgery. They actually uh, you know, look pretty good. And then when they go to our epilepsy unit, we, we monitor them for seizures. We can oftentimes capture exactly where the seizures are coming from. And then we go back, and at least at UCI, the way I do it is I remove the electrodes, send them home, allow them to heal from that, and we bring them back and then do the therapeutic surgery uh, of choice. Now. Uh, really important here uh, is that the decision as to what surgery you have done, uh, if you're going to have one of these surgeries, is that it's really based on the patient's clinical presentation. So there's not one, one surgery is not better than the other, not one surgery is not, doesn't give us more information or anything like that. It's really that we have to look at each patient and come up with the right surgery that gives us the right information as, in terms of what we're looking for. Now, uh, this is what uh, subdural grids look like. This is what it looks like on the brain. This is that silastic uh, uh, um, grid that we have in those platinum electrodes. And then again, this is really the areas of, of, that we're most interested in. These are the language areas over here, and this is the motor area. If we think that seizures are coming from somewhere near those areas, then this is the, the study of choice. Now, um, again, just talking about some of the advantages. So, like we talked about, we can do functional mapping as part of it. If we think that the seizures are coming from somewhere very, you know, very uh, superficial on the covering of the brain, this is a very good option for those patients. Like I already mentioned, you know, there are larger craniotomies that are required. It's a little more difficult if you want to do surgery on both sides of the brain. If you have a concern that the seizures are mainly coming from some of the deeper parts of the brain, then this is probably not the best surgery. Now, this is SEEG. This is what um, uh, this is the other epilepsy surgery uh, diagnostic test that we do. And you see here that this is all. There's no large incision. That there's are very pinhole openings. This, the electrodes go all the way into the deeper parts of the brain. Um, the way we do this surgery is a little different. We have a pre-implantation hypothesis. So we come up with a plan even before the patient goes to surgery, and we say these are the areas that we're most uh, concerned for that potentially could have seizures. Then we implant the electrodes. Um, 
patients are again admitted to the epilepsy monitoring unit. We monitor them, capture enough seizures. Then uh, our, the way we do it is usually after about a week or so, remove the electrodes, they go home, and then uh, at a later time we bring them back to do the definitive surgery to treat the, that's, that epilepsy. Again, as I mentioned, so it's a less invasive test. Um, we can sample multiple parts of the brain. In fact, we can sample both sides of the brain. Sometimes people who have epilepsy, it's one of the things we want to know is which side of the brain it's coming from because maybe a seizure starts in one area and then very quickly goes to the other. And so this is a very good test to, to do that. As I said before, it gives us the deeper structures. We're able to test some of the deeper parts of the brain which often cause seizures. Um, one of the big disadvantages, I would say, is that in terms of the functional mapping that I talked about before, this really isn't the best option. So if, you're, if we are concerned that potentially the seizures are coming from a part of the brain that's very functional, again, the language or motor, then SEEG is probably not the best um, uh, surgery for that. Now, so we talked about those diagnostic procedures. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the therapeutic surgeries that we often. So, if you imagine, if we do all these tests and everything kind of points to one area, then we can, rather than doing any other type of test, we can go straight to surgery and you know, potentially make you seizure free. So we have lots of different types of surgery uh, in epilepsy surgery. These are some of my patients. This is, these are more maximally invasive surgeries. So uh, what you see here is a hemispherectomy on the right. This is a right temporal lobectomy. These are large parts of the brain that we remove. Now, if one of the things I always tell people is that this is not normal brain that we're removing. That's not the goal of surgery. The goal is to remove the part that's causing the seizures. And these are some of our best surgeries in terms of doing that because the, the more you're able to safely take out, the more you're able to uh, remove um, that, that is causing the seizures, the higher the likelihood of becoming seizure free. Now, some of the things that we now have, which we didn't used to have and, and have really made epilepsy surgery very, very, uh, it's a very exciting in, in, uh, field right now, is that we have these minimally invasive or less invasive options. So this is a uh, RNS neuropace device. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And this is a laser ablation. So with these types of surgeries, we can actually do things through pinhole openings in the skin. We're able to implant stimulators on the brain and uh, treat people who, even as you know, four years ago, we had no option. So, for instance, if you had seizures coming from your motor area or your language area, even as close as four years ago, there were very few options and not really great options for those patients. Now, with this NeuroPace device, um, we actually have some really good uh, options, and I'll talk about some of the patients we've operated on. So, the NeuroPace, what exactly is it? Um, Essentially what it is, is we implant this uh, generator in the skull, so we make a small opening in the skull. Once we've localized where the seizures are coming from, if we find that the seizures come from a part of the brain that we cannot resect, so again, it goes back to motor and language for the most part. The other, time, the other thing we've done with neuropace is that we're implanting them bilaterally. So if you have seizures coming from both temporal lobes, this is a really good option for you. And the way that it works is very similar to how uh, a pacemaker works in theory. So uh, we implant the electrodes, it's constantly listening for seizures. When it starts to see a seizure start to build up, uh, what it does is that that generator will send an electrical stimulation and actually, you know, and oftentimes stop the seizure from propagating. And um, uh, especially when we're able to very, you know, uh, to localize the seizures to very well, this has worked really, really well in some patients. Now, um, this is to, uh, I think five years is the end point here, but we actually have now eight year uh, uh, data, which shows that um, it's about 70 to 75% uh, uh, benefit to these patients. So really, this is some of the most difficult seizures to treat because these are seizures that if I resect your motor area, if I resect your language area, those are things that, you know, that are really, uh, that cause major deficits. And so in those patients, even as close as, you know, three, four, five years ago, we didn't really have the kind of options we do now. So uh, Neuropace has really become a, a, you know, a game changer in some, some patients. This is a robot. This is the robot, Rosa robot. We were actually were very fortunate. We were the first center on the West Coast to have this robot. And what it does is it allows me to uh, be very accurate and precise in how we implant our electrodes. Although we still, I mean, I do all the surgery, we do all the implantation, 
this device gives us a very, uh, it helps us and it gives us a very accurate and, and uh, uh, precise way to implant these electrodes. So uh, this is something that we've been do using at UCI for almost two years and it really has made a, a difference and an improvement in terms of um, the accuracy and precision of the surgeries we do. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about laser ablation. I think that's something that's also been very beneficial to us uh, for, you know, in patients who have very deep-seated lesions that are otherwise very difficult to treat. Um, this is uh, a patient who had uh, mesial temporal sclerosis, and so what we, were, what we can do is implant this laser through a pinhole opening, and uh, using real-time, uh, within an MRI machine, you can actually watch in real-time as this ablation occurs, and with heat therapy, we can actually treat this area and, and, and cause a burn in that area, which then uh, you know, helps patients become seizure-free. So I'm going to give you some illustrative cases. These are some of the patients we've operated on and some of the uh, very interesting cases that we've had since uh, starting here. So this was a 36-year-old gentleman, uh, had seizures since the age of nine, of nine months. He had a very complicated seizure history. He had originally had a, a subdural grid placed for seizures about 10 years ago. And they actually were able to localize his seizures to the left-hand motor area. Now, the problem was that at that time, as I mentioned, that we didn't have neuropace, we didn't have devices like that. But what they did offer them was a uh, multiple sub-peel transection. And the patient refused. That was his dominant hand, was the right hand. He said, you know, nothing, to, you know, he didn't want that surgery done. Unfortunately, what happened was that he actually went on to have a wound infection and the bone got infected, and so he had this uh, a large cranioplasty. So he had the, the bone removed, and he had a cranioplasty back in 2008. And so the patient, um, so we talked about the patient again uh, in our epilepsy conference last year, and one of the things that we thought was that this patient may be a good candidate for an RNS device. And so uh, I removed the surgical pictures, but what I ended up doing was I made a small opening in his cranioplasty and then implanted these grids on top of the, on the covering of the brain to ensure that where the seizures were coming from were uh, the same as they were before and to make sure that we, we knew exactly where the seizures were coming from. Uh, we did find that the seizures came from just two fo very small electrodes right here and here, and those were right in his hand motor area. Now because of that, um, this patient was a great candidate for uh, RNS, and so this is what it looked like at the end. So this is his cranioplasty here. This was the uh, opening that I made, and we implanted this battery, and then just underneath it, you see there's, there's uh, three electrodes sitting right on top of where his uh, motor area was. And uh, so this patient, um, very interestingly, so after his surgery, what he would say is that um, before surgery, he would have a, a, an aura where he would feel some numbness tingling in his arm and his leg, and he knew that was the beginning of a seizure. And, and so um, after the surgery, what he said is that, you know, he would feel that beginning, this aura, this kind of uh, numbness and tingling. But then rather than go on to have a seizure, he just would say that, you know, it would go away, and he would just have nothing after that. And, uh, you know, he stated that his actual seizure frequency decreased about 80%. So um, you can imagine in someone who has a very difficult, really no other good operative uh, options, this patient did very well. This is another patient. He had a, a history for, of seizures for a very long time, and uh, he had a workup which showed an 8 millimeter hypothalamic hematoma. Now, um, a hypothalamic hematoma sits in the hypothalamus in the very deepest part of the brain. If you imagine, I like to you know, give this analogy, if you imagine you cut a, a basketball in half, and you put a tic-tac right in the middle of that, that, and then you say, well, I'm gonna take a straw and try and hit that tic-tac. That's kind of the, the, the equivalent of what a hypothalamic hematoma is with the laser. Um, but even with you know, the difficulty of the location and everything else, we were able to implant this electrode, uh, the laser cannula, we were, we were able to ablate that, uh, the hypothalamic hematoma. Patient went home on, on day one after surgery and he's been seizure-free for about 18 months now. Uh, and then this is the last one we'll talk about. This was a patient who had uh, a, a tumor that was diagnosed about 10 years ago. And he presented with seizures, and he went to an outside hospital, and they removed the tumor. But they didn't remove the area where the seizures were coming from. And as I'd mentioned earlier, um, even though he was, you know, his tumor was, was treated, he continued to have seizures. And he had seizures for over 10 years after that. Um, in addition to that, not only was, was that the case, but he also had several back surgeries, and so he, he was a patient who had a lot of chronic pain. 
And so um, this is what his MRI looked like when he presented to us. So this was his, the, the area where they'd removed the tumor, and this is where the seizures were coming from. So I talked to the patient. I gave him several options. We said, you know, we could go back and do a large incision, take out that area, uh, and, uh, you, know, you know, treat the seizures. Uh, you know, that would be more pain related with that. And, and um, you know, he was on several pain medications. So, we, so uh, we also had this option, which we ended up doing, which was this laser ablation. So again, using a, just a pinhole opening, we implanted this laser. Uh, we were able to ablate the entire area. This is, I don't know if it projects well, but you can see all this, uh, this rim over here. That's all the area that we ablated. Uh, if you look at it on the coronal side, you can see that the entire, all the this mesial structures, all the area where the seizures were coming from, uh, those were treated with this uh, ablation. So, and the patient's been seizure free. He's done very well as well. Um, so really just kind of in, in conclusion, I would say that off, you know, it's important to remember a few things. One is that the ictal onset is not within the lesion. It's oftentimes somewhere in the vicinity of it, but generally not actually within the lesion. Um, if, to be an epilepsy surgery candidate, I didn't talk very much about this, but you have to have failed medications. Uh, usually you fail two medications. After you fail two medications, the likelihood of becoming seizure-free on medication alone goes almost to zero. And so once you've gotten to that point, uh, the next step is to be evaluated at a level four center where we can offer all the different types of seizure uh, treatments there are. Uh, in terms of types of surgery, we have diagnostic procedures, we have therapeutic surgeries. And then the last thing is that you know we have new devices that are available and these have really helped us in, in treating some very difficult to, to treat epilepsy patients. Um, any questions? Steve, you said to diagnose if you're a good candidate, you have to be uh, in the hospital and have a seizure. Is this still the same? So, um, so the question was, uh, to be diagnosed with seizures, you have to come to the hospital and, and get an EEG and, and uh, to be diagnosed and to undergo the rest of the workup. And yes, that is still the same. We, as part of, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, part of the workup is to do a video EEG where you're admitted to the hospital, they have a camera on you, they monitor you for seizures. Once you have a seizure, we can you know, correlate the, the video, the, the semiology, the type of seizure you had with the, uh, uh, electrographic, um, you know, findings. So you, have to have a you have to have a seizure. You have to be in the hospital and get monitored for that. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, Twenty-seven years ago, I remember to go to the and it seemed like things were good, but now I, um, I have catamenial nocturnal seizures. Okay. And you seem to be having a lot more than usual. I don't know. If Okay. But I'm just kind of worried if maybe when they took it out that there may be still scar tissue maybe causing them. Sure. Well, you know, we, we have very good studies that show, you know, at you know, around ten years there are there is a, a good number of patients who for some reason have new onset or or, or seizures down, you know, down the line. Um, and so uh, that could be potentially what this is. Well, so uh, you're on, who's, who manages your medications? Um, Here, your neurologist does. I would certainly bring that up as an option. I would, um, if you, you know, I would go through and, and maybe have a trial of different medications again. But um, I think that, you know, it, it's very likely that it could be that there's some residual scar or maybe there's a, a new focus. It's hard to know, uh, you know, but I think that it's certainly a good idea to be evaluated again. Is it um, okay to go in there again after? Well, you know, again, we'd have to, you know, look at your whole picture and, and you know, involve the entire team. But um, I, I didn't include this here, but we've written, I've looked at several, um, uh, we've looked at surgeries, patients who have had re-operations. We've had surgeries where we've implanted electrodes and you already had surgery. We've done, you know, and, and it's very safe. It's very effective. The patients do really well. Um, even though it's, you know, more difficult, there's some scarring and everything else, it's still not the, you know, it's still a very good option. And, I, and if it were me and, and I was in that situation, I would at least go through the process. Any other questions? No? All right. Thank you very much.